Oh, you, oh you're doing good. I was throwing my shadow, my head shadow. <laughs> That's all right. It's better now. Much better. Thank you very, very, very much. I shared in the first service a dream that I had. And uh, most of you know I have a, a grandson, 10 months old, and I'm, my wife and I are, are raising him, best we know how to do. But the Lord gave me a dream. He's sort of like the apple of my eye. He's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And, of course, I had a lot of different plans that when I was 65. I wasn't planning on, you know, being a grand manny. But nevertheless, the Lord knows about what to do. But uh, I shared my dream this morning about Noah and I going down a road together. It was a curvy, long road. And I stopped him and I said, you stay here. I'm going to go before you. And so I took off running down the road to see what was there to make sure everything was okay. I seen everything you can see, every pothole, every watch out. And I turned around and he was so little, he was way back here. And I said, Noah, come on. And Noah started coming through that weavy road and I was just directing him, no, 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 come over this way. You'll fall in that pit. And he was following me. And I had already been where he's going, so I knew exactly what to say to him. And then when service was over, Patricia Thompson, which has really developed immensely in interpretation of dreams and teaching on dreams, and when she does, those of you that come and get that, you know what I'm talking about. So she comes and she says, I got to tell you the meaning of that dream. I said, go ahead, let me have it. She said, well, she said, you was Noah. And Noah was the father, the heavenly father. And Noah represented the church, us. And God is going out before this church. And he is going to bring us down a different direction. And he's already gone out before us. And we're going to miss every pothole. And we're not going to hit all the ditches. And we're going to stay right in the will of the Father. Because we know that he's gone before us. And he's not going to leave us. That's something. He can go before you and stay with you. Not leave you nor forsake you. Can I get an amen? And so with that. It's kind of got me a little pumped up. Because I was trying not to uh, run to my office and just boo-hoo out of happiness. But my father was a Baptist preacher, spirit-filled, spoke in tongues, laid hands on the sick, anoint you with oil, and believed God. And he was that way from the time he got saved. And I guess he's still that way. He's been in heaven about 31 years. But my father came up to me, and uh, just like God told Hezekiah to get his house in order, and he sat down and he says, son, I'm going home in six months and God told me to get my house in order and I need to talk to you. So he told me things he wanted me to do. I'm going, are you sick? Have you had a problem? He's going, no, no, I'm fine. It's just God told me this is what's happening. And I said, mm, I don't know about all this. So anyway, everything he said for that six months happened. And he's telling me during the time that he's talking to me, he said, I had a dream that I want to tell you about. And I said, sure. He said, I had a dream of you and I. When I had the dream of Noah, I thought of my father and me. And so he said, we were in a river with a whole lot of people. And we all were going down this river and heads were bobbling up and down. Did anybody know what that river was? In the dream, the river was religion. And we were all going the same way. I had just jumped in because I got born again. And I had just jumped in the river. And so we're going down the river. And he said, Larry, all of a sudden, you come running out of that river. And you climbed up the bank. And there was a bicycle there. And you jumped on that bicycle. And you just took off and left everybody. And I said, God, what is that? And my daddy said, the Lord told him, he says, I'm going to do a quicker work in the last days, and I'm going to use your son. And so when he told me that dream, and I took off on the bicycle, and they were still in the religious river going down, he said, I rode in front of the river, way up in front of everybody. And I know what it was after I got that prophecy from him is when I started preaching at Duke Power every day off of cranes and irons and walls and beams and and I mean hundreds and hundreds and hundreds come to Christ. Church, we're in a very unique time. We really are. The prince and the power of the air is lying hard as he can, screaming and hollering because, pow, he's already been crushed and bumped and squished. And it's, I mean, his time's up. 
And we've got to understand what's happening in the earth. Jesus said himself that there is going to be a lot of tribulation, but it's not appointed to you. Are you hearing me? Well, let's go ahead and get in the word here. Let's go to James in chapter 1. And I know you guys know where that is. If my Bible don't fall apart, I got to start using a different one, I guess. This one can't stand but so much. I tell you what, though, you look at an old worn out Bible. And then when you get old, you better hope you're as worn out as that Bible is. Because you'll be ready to roll if you are. Amen. That's... By the way, I know what I'm getting ready to share and say. Some of you go, oh, come on, Pastor. I mean, that's elementary. I have a real deep word for you. What do you have for breakfast? Tell me, what do y'all eat for breakfast? You don't eat breakfast. Well, I tell you right now, I love grits and eggs. I like them over easy, and I like them mixed up in my grits, and I like them cooked with salt and pepper and butter. Oh, it is yummy. And guess how much I eat? A lot. And guess how often? A lot. Grits and eggs every day. Every day. Every day. Grits and eggs. Every day. I can have it for supper when people don't know what to do. I said, let's fix grits and eggs. I'm serious. And then you get into scripture sometimes and people go, I'm not even going to open my Bible. I know that one. Oh, you don't want no more grits and eggs? Don't you love them? Yeah, but I know all about grits and eggs. You may have known about grits and eggs, but you won't taste them today. We're going to still have grits and eggs. You just think you're going to taste your grits and eggs. But you can't taste them if you're not eating them. So, if I can eat the same thing every day, then I can go to the same scriptures every day. And I can feed my spirit. Why don't we all just get in a pack right now? Let's just make an agreement. That we will get in the word at least as much time and as many times a day as we spend eating food. Use that for your word time. Oh, don't misunderstand me. You can, you can get in the word all day if you want to. But I'm just saying, if you spend 20 minutes at breakfast feeding your body, spend 20 minutes in the word. If you have a 30-minute lunch break, have a 30-minute word break. What you going to do at supper? Well, you feed your body three times a day or four or five. And no telling how many knickknacks at night standing there at the refrigerator letting all the cold air out. And you knew what was in there before you opened the door. Because you've been in there how many times? You've memorized it. And you're still standing there. Do I want the cold chicken? Do I want to eat that old taco? Do I want to get, you know. Are you all right? All right. Well, James said in verse 1. A servant of God, a servant servant of God of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad greeting. Let me stop for a minute because sometimes when we read scripture, we really miss a lot. I'm serious. You just, you know, because the next verse says, you know, uh, count it all joy in the uh, diver temptations and stuff like that. But before you get to that, man, they're being persecuted. I'm talking about the government has turned on them. They are looking for them to kill them. They done crucified Christ. Hello. Some years have gone by. James and all of the others are out doing the word. And the churches are in people's homes. They're not going to the sanctuary yet because they'll get killed. They'll burn it down. Now you're looking at me funny. But what if that was the day for us? What if they came and got rid of this building? Where will you be tomorrow? Next Sunday, where are we going to meet? Because is this the building or is this the building? One of us is the church. Either the metal or the flesh and the spirit. Hello, we the church. My flesh is the house. My spirit is of God. Are you hearing me? And so when we look at this, we have to understand these were people under great tribulation, if you will. They were running for their lives and believing God. And they're like, what's happened? But they started seeing God move miraculously in every area. And 20 years later, the Apostle Paul pops up. Hallelujah. I've always thought that he must have took the place of Matthias, who is the one they drew straws for to win the place to replace Judas. And then the 12 thought that they, well, we 11, we got to have 12. Let's just vote. And so they voted like the Baptists do, and they got Matthias. Never heard of him again. He got voted in, and blink, his name's never mentioned. Where'd he go? What happened? I'll tell you what I think happened. 
God didn't pick him, and he couldn't handle walking with those other 11. Are you all right? But Paul, when he came, an apostle born out of season, woo, brought the revelations to us. Can I get an amen? And then he says here, he says, those that are scattered. Now, he's talking to people that are scattered, and you're not. You're pretty well settled, got a car and a home, most of you. And he says, now, brethren, count it joy. If you will, let's paraphrase. He says, look, that situation y'all in right now, be excited about it. Can you imagine going through something like that and somebody coming up to you and saying, you ought to be excited. And you can say, are you kidding me? Do you know how many people are at the government's hunting me? They got the town sheriff looking for me. They think because I just praise God that I'm a lunatic. They think I'm a devil. That's the way the government and the people that weren't of God thought of what was happening with Christianity. But oh, did God bring a revival. And he says, knowing this, so you don't really count anything joy when you're going through all these tribulations unless you know this. Amen? Knowing this, the trying of your faith. That right there tells you what's going on with you. If you have begun to meditate on the word and speak the word and do the word in any form or area, I'm going to tell you it will get tested. It will get tested. I, my wife and I just got born again, went to the Baptist church. They come out and taught on tithing real good. And we sit there and listen. And I said, I, my daddy, I'm not knocking him. I, I knew he gave money, but I didn't know anything about tithing. And, and I said, what is this? And then when I heard it, something clicked in my spirit. We were three weeks old in the Lord. $30,000 in debt on credit cards. Nine months behind on the house payment. You wouldn't understand. And gosh, there was so much other stuff. Uh, the, the car, the bank was looking for the car. It was like three or four months behind. I parked the car behind the house, behind some big giant marijuana plants I had growing so you couldn't see it. Y'all think I'm kidding. And so I parked my car so the bank couldn't come and get my car. I wasn't too worried about the nine months on the house payment because it wasn't in my name. It was in my daddy's. So all this stuff is coming on us and we get in the word. And as soon as we start getting in the word and we hear about tithing, I looked at Kathy and I said, well, let's do it. And she looked at me and thought for a minute. And I looked at her and I said, well, you know, you carry a checkbook, write it. So she just wrote that thing out real quick. And when we got through and we got out of church, you know, we was like, we just gave, I made good money. And so a tithe was a good chunk. And so we just wrote our first tithe in that check, 10% of what we both make, and we just stuck it in there. Still don't have the revelation of it, just know I'm supposed to do it, art to, and just did it. But boy, things started getting tough after that. And it was like, ooh, I mean, you know, and we had bills to pay, we had stuff to do, and things, but we, we kept doing it. We just kept doing it. We had a little refrigerator about this high that held two trays of ice in the ice box. That was it. It was called an ice box because it was not a freezer. <sighs> so we had that. And so we started speaking the word as we were learning. And we started believing God. And we started just saying things and doing things. And, and it just got a little worse looking. And we just kept going. And then one day we came home and that little refrigerator, this is like, seriously, like a 1930 model. I mean, if you hit it with your fist, which I did, it will not dent. Ask my elbow and my knuckles. Anyway, <laughs> we come home and there's eight $100 bills. Now, this ain't bad for 1977. Hello, 40 years ago, eight $100 bills with a magnet and a big, beautiful picture of a refrigerator. And big new refrigerator on it. Letting us know. Go, we still to this day have no idea who did it or what. So you know who we give praise and honor and glory and credit to. And I still would if I knew who did it. Because I know he spoke to somebody and they got blessed for doing it. It might have been a group of people. I don't know. An angel might have walked in and had plenty of money and said, I'll leave that for Larry. I don't know. But it was there. And we started seeing God move right then. And from that point on, it never stopped. 
It never stopped. God kept blessing us and blessing us. And then in December of 1979, December the 1st, we were in the Kenneth Copeland meeting in Charlotte, and he calls me out. I was ushering. I was way out. And he calls me out, and I come walking down to him with the usher bucket. And he started prophesying to me. And he prophesied about our finances that not many days long gone by that you're going to be completely free of all debts of all kinds and you are going to be a blessing unto many. And he just kept prophesying that. And lo and behold, everything started happening after that. The doors of ministry opened up. Uh, Maranatha Faith Center. I mean everything. And, and that was my home church where Pastor Little John uh, was attending and doing children's church there. And I know I've told y'all about this, but those little things are things like this. It takes us an hour and ten minutes to get to church. So we go Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday night, and Thursday night every week. Still both of us, she worked at the phone company. I'm hanging still at Duke Power. And I worked a good 60 to 70 hours a week. Went to church four times a week. We were wide open. So we got up one Sunday morning after we'd done started doing all this stuff. We just... We're not in the position that we had a lot of money. We were giving, but we didn't have anything. We had a quarter of a tank of gas and a little Dodge Colt station wagon. That thing must have got 40 miles to the gallon. I said, we got enough gas to get to Gaffney. I said, we can go to church, and we'll just believe God that he'll do something to get us home. Boy, we got excited. We throwed the kids in the car, me and my wife, praise God, all the way to Gaffney. Beautiful, hot summer day. Parked the car in the sun. We went inside. Church was awesome. I'm not, it's one of the best services ever. We, I said, oh, this is the day. Hallelujah. I don't know what's going to happen, but when we leave, hallelujah, I'm going to have gas. I just believed it. And so we just went through the whole thing, and the church was over. And everybody fellowshipping and hugging. A little bit later, a few people left. A little bit later, nobody left. And a little bit later, Kathy and I and the kids are sitting in the sun out there in the car. And it's baking. The doors are open. And I said, well, I know it's on empty, but we got enough gas to get in the shade. I said, let's move over here in the shade. She said, yeah, let's get out of this heat. Well, I cranked that little Dodge cold up and that gas hand said, Bing. I'm not joking. And I sat there and thought, my Lord, I've been sitting here for two hours sweating. And I had a full tank of gas the whole time. How did it get there? somebody, somebody, I don't know. But you, it was just the faith of believing God to go worship him and get his word. And when we got finished, we might not have known how to do what to do, but before the day was over, we got so blessed. We were there so long, we decided to stay. I had the gas, but I didn't go home because I was going to have to drive back to church again. So we just stayed in Gaffney and went to church that night. Is God good or is God what? Now, that might sound like nothing to you. Well, he had some gas. Well, I've got a $500,000 debt. Hey, listen, it's as easy for God to take care of that as it is for him to put gas in your car. It is. Tons of stories like that. But anyway, you know this. The trying of your faith works patience. You know what patience is, don't you? That's something you got to have right now. You know, patience. <laughs> You'll get that later. He said, but let patience have her. Did you notice, even though it's in italic, they referred it to her? It's not in the original. It's, it's sort of like wisdom is referred as her. Wisdom is a she. When it says she, that's referring to like a woman. And a woman was made from Adam's rib. And that word for, in Hebrew for Adam's rib is in the Bible two times. The one time is Adam and the other Solomon's temple, the beams that hold up the, of the temple and the beauty of it. And it means that a woman is your strength, your support, and your beauty. That's what the word rib means. A woman's rib, the rib of a man that made a woman was his strength, his beauty, his support. When you go into the word and it says she, there's your strength, there's your beauty. There's your reward. It's always in her, in she. She wisdom will keep you. But let patience have her perfect, mature, grown-up, finished work. That you may be grown-up, finished, perfect, and entire, 
wanting nothing or being a person not left to want. I love it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And his old sister Benjamin, if anybody remembers her, I hadn't seen her in 30 years. She's probably in heaven, I guess. I think she was about 90 when she said it. But she stood up in church and said, The Lord's my shepherd, and I shall not want. And I won't. <laughs> and when she hollered, And I won't, I said, Woohoo! That's what I'm talking about. Are y'all all right? You bunch of Baptists. I'm going to get all of you. All right. If any of you lack wisdom, Ask God. Let him ask of God. And it gives to all men. That means some of you, right? All means somebody. All means all men. And it'll be given him. Do you know why most people don't have wisdom? Because they really won't ask for it. Pride. The reason you don't ask for anything is pride. You don't want no help. Do it yourself. I got relatives that are going to do it themselves. You ought to see them. But let him ask in faith. What is faith? Believing that you received. Faith is living in the invisible. I've been teaching on that. George Garland, a comedian, had people rolling for 30 minutes talking about how ignorant it is for people to worship an invisible man. And you give your money to an invisible person. And he went on and on and on and on. And then when he died, I thought, I bet he knows a lot about invisible now. Because you was created, created out of the invisible. Oh well. So let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. Don't waver. Because he that wavereth is what? He's like a wave of the sea. You ever watch the ocean? Which direction is the water going? He's like the sea driven with the wind and toss. Wind changes north, south, east, and west all the time. It says don't let that man be thinking. You ought not to be thinking that you're going to receive anything of the Lord. Do you know what that means, by the way? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Unsure in decisions. Unsure in decisions. If you're unsure in every decision, then you'll be unstable in every way. You must be sure of your decision. Hallelujah. A double-minded man is unstable. In all his ways. Well, let's look at the reciprocal. A single minded man is stable in all of his ways. Being single minded means keeping your mind, your eyes on the word. And I know some of you, man, I know the word. I know Mark 11 23, I can quote it backwards. How long has it been since you looked at it and read it? Let me tell you something that hit me the other day. I was talking to Dr. Clarice Fluitt, Bishop Fluitt, the other day. We were having some time while she was doing uh, Sis Roth's miracle things, and we were all there. and And we were talking about this stuff. And I'm telling you, that woman's got so much faith and she's got so much grace. I'm so honored to be sitting under her and listening to her. But she began to just expound to me also of what's happening in the last days, what God is calling us to do in the last days. And I'm thinking, but it sounds so much deeper than what we've learned and what we know. And she's reinforcing You need to go back to the very basics and keep hashing, 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 hashing like your grits and eggs. I've had grits and eggs. I'm ready for a steak. Steak is for an evening meal. You need to get your break fast first. And you can't break your fast unless you fasted. Fasting always brings discipline and maturity to you. If you don't know how to fast, start a meal. And then do a day. And then after you get used to that, do three days. And after you do three days, go, go a week. And then a little while longer, if you go on a week, go two weeks. And a little longer after you've done two weeks, go three weeks. I would advise you to drink water. That's what I do. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. You know why? Because we love to eat. Now I'm talking about your God. I'm taking your God from you. Not you, you, but, but somebody out there. You know, Lord food. <laughs> You don't bless it, you just consume it. I am telling you that these days, are there's something going on because when I was talking to Clarice, I just told her, I said, my eyes, this is what I'm getting at. I said, the Bible says in Proverbs 4.20, my son, attend unto my what? Words. For they are what? Unto those that what? 
Find them. And then he says, don't let them depart from what? From your eyes. Preachers are the most guilty of getting, it's not knocking anybody. I know from experience. You get so much in busy. Now you can get so busy with people. That's what religion does. It takes five-fold ministry and has them doing what the church should be doing. I'm serious. And you get so involved with it that you almost don't have time to read. You don't have time to get in the Word. I, I mean, by the time you come home at night, you're exhausted, you're tired, and all you've heard from people all day is, this hurts, that hurts, I'm dying, they told me i got three weeks to live, and you cut them off, she get about, come out in the name of you, happy heal. And you come home, you're like, eh, eh, eh. you know, I'm too tired to read, I'm too tired, I, I, I got it, I got it, and you go to sleep. But what happened was, I was hearing it. Are you hearing me? And I can even say it. I can even think about it. But I closed off a gate. It's the one that keeps the eyes. He's not talking about these eyes. He's talking about your spirit man. That your spirit stays in that word and sees that word. Because that word is life. And if you're not seeing it in the spirit... Then it says the word that you're looking at. Keep your eyes on it. Because it's out. And it says out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks. It also says that out of the abundance of the heart flows the issues of life. Oh, I mean, do you know what's in you? I guess what's happening with me is I go get breakfast sometime. And I sit with these bunch of preachers. And both. And... <clears throat> Probably one of them's going to watch it. One that said it is going to be here. I call your name out. I love you. I really do. But bless your heart. But while I'm standing there talking to them, and I do love you, I don't think I know more than you do. But all they want to talk about is stuff like, "Isn't it amazing how Jesus did what He did? As poor as He was." And I said, "What do you mean poor? Well, Bible says that He was made poor to make us rich, and and they don't ever go no more to the rich." I said, "Well, that doesn't mean that He was born poor. Oh, yes, He was. He was born in a manger." I said, but he was born in a manger because his family went to that city to pay taxes. And the rooms were full because everybody else come to pay taxes. But to fulfill the scripture in the Old Testament, he was born in a manger. The feeding place where you come to get fed. Anyway, they're all like, no, 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 no. He was a pauper. He, he, he was poor. He didn't have anything. I, oh, yeah. So I said, I guess y'all probably believe in the three wise men. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. I said, well, they ain't. They're not in there. But there are wise men in there. And nobody knows how many. And they brought what? Myrrh. Frankincense. And what? Gold? To who? To Mary and Joseph. What? Jesus was two years old. And here come a bunch of wise men and laid it down. The Bible says that Joseph was a carpenter. How about that? A homeless carpenter. So anyway, a man can build a home and he ain't even got one. Raised his son on a dirt road. Well, maybe he stayed in the manger most of the time. But I hear all that and see the poverty mentality in that. And they started talking about the preachers that we know on TV. And it was just terrible. And I mean, they're knocking the preachers. and We're all poverty minded. And, and, and the devil's in charge. And he's running everything. And boy, is it bad out there. To, my God, the tribulation. And the rapture. Hallelujah, we're getting ready to escape it all. Well, listen, you're just not in God's army. God's army is not ready to leave. The Bible says out of a commission from the commander-in-chief Jesus, he said what? Occupy until I come. What is occupy? It's a military term. Take the hill and hold it. Ask our boys from Nam what it is to take a hill and hold it. And I mean hold it. Don't let it go. And once you get to the top of the hill, combat's a lot easier. It's easier to be at the top than it is at the bottom. That's why every time you know you're going to get in a combat situation, you go to the highest ground you can get. That's your protection. You can see you're more protected. It's more effort for the enemy to come to you and easier for you to get them. High places. God said, come up hither and I'll show you. Oh, well. Let me move on anyway. In, in Hebrews chapter 12, he says this in the first three verses. And if you want to know if it was a title to this, I guess I would just keep it on what I've been doing. Understanding faith, 
because when you understand a lot of this, you understand faith. And we know he says, wherefore, and I don't have time to back up into chapter 11, but it's because of what chapter 11 is talking about. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight the sin that does so easily beset us. And let us run. Here we go. Remember, we needed what? Patience. And let us run with patience. And where are we going to get it from? By letting it have its perfect work. By not thinking it's a strange thing concerning the fiery trials that try you as though some strange thing has happened. I'm telling you the enemy is opposed to everything the word is. But he doesn't have the power to stop it. All you hearing is the lie about it. The deception about it. He's not coming in with some great power. And there's nothing you can do about it. He's nothing... I'll be honest with you, this sounds political, but here it comes. He's like CNN. I mean, if you ever want a network that lies, if you listen to CNN, I don't even want to talk to you about what's going on in the world because you don't know. You don't. You have no idea. That's the biggest lying network I've ever seen. I call it the Communist News Network. And the more time goes by, the more they prove it. Are you all right? All right, but they speak words. Words. They, it's called news. I call it bad news. My president calls it fake news. You know what fake news is? It's when your body starts telling you the way it's going to be. Well, my knee's killing me, I'm telling you. I guess the next one's mother knee's going to get, oh, God, I ain't going to be able to walk when nothing hits like that. But people do talk like that. That's what, how you doing down? Fairly middling. I kind of, I kind of took something for the flu. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did too. First Peter 2, 24. <laughs> Woo! Took my shot. Can I get an amen? Kathy and I talk about that all the time. Time for a flu shot. First Peter 2. I'm a veteran. Every time I walk in, ready for a flu shot? I said, nope. You give me one 25 years ago and I got the flu. I don't want the flu. And they say, it's to keep you from getting the flu. I said, but every time I get one, I get the flu. And if I don't get one, I don't get the flu. And I don't want one because I don't want the flu. I, I know the doctors aren't in agree with me, but Dr. Jesus is. Let us run with patience. The race is set before you. There's a race set before you. A race. Run, brother, run. You know? You remember we were watching on the film in the Olympic race where the guy fell and got hurt? And he was determined to finish. I think he broke his leg, but he got up and he was hobbling. And his father <laughs> come running out of the stands and went running down there and picked him up and run him through the race. And while I was watching that, I don't know what everybody else was thinking, but I was thinking, that's me and God right there. That's me and God. I don't care where I'm at in the race. When I fell down, he come running out and he picked me up and said, son, we're going to finish. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, does this mean I'm going to be last or first? And then it hit me. That's what the last shall be. Ah! And so just carry me on in, God. Just carry me on in. With my, you know what I'm saying? Woo, glory to God. It gets exciting. But here's something. Here's how it happens. Looking to Jesus. He's the author. That means beginner. And ha, ha, finisher of faith. It says our in italics. Everything in italics is not in the original print. That's when the canon got together and we're putting all these words together. They thought, we need to add a word here to help them understand it. Well, they added the word to help you understand what they thought. So sometimes you ought to just look at that italic and take it out and just see what it's really saying and what do you think. If you don't, you can let other people think for you. So look to Jesus. He's the beginner and the finisher of our faith. Who, for the joy, was set before him. See, this scripture backs up everything about him being in Gethsemane, saying, pass this cup from me. That right there shows you he wasn't saying, I want to show you my human side, I don't want to die. In Gethsemane, it looked like he was going to die. He began to sweat blood. And what he was saying is, I can't die here. Pass this cup of death in Gethsemane. Pass this cup. I got to go to the cross. And it says right here, he did what? The joy that was set before him. Endured the cross. Despised the shame. 
and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, all that's invisible, but watch this. And you've been seated in heavenly divine authority places with him. That's invisible. You can't see me sitting beside Jesus and the Father, but I am. That's where I'm seated. So, when I go to do something I shouldn't, guess who's going with me? I'm telling you, I've been raising this grandkid and this thing is working on me. He's the apple of my eye and I done told him in the first service, the thing about him is he is showing me how I probably make God feel. Because I'm trying to train him and I'm teaching him and I'm sure I'm doing things with him I've never done with any other little kids ever. Because I finally come to the place in my elder age here, children are much more smarter than you think they are. And if you're going to put them in the word, they're ten times, according to scripture, ten times smarter than the worldly people. Ten times. So I'm going to give him the word. We read him the word. We, we, I mean, it's in his bedroom constantly going when he's in the bed at night. But he does love Fox News for some reason and football. I don't know why he loves that stuff, but he loves football and Fox. He, 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 y'all think I'm being funny. I'm telling you, when it comes on, he'll pop his little head up and just look like he knows what they're talking about. But the little fella, God has used the little fella to show me so much about him and I. And I even changing his diaper. So um, I'm getting too real. I need to dismiss and let y'all go eat for sure. But it's like, it's like the other day, it was for the first, I, he's starting to eat our food. That changes the things about the diaper. I, if my wife was here, I'd be getting really rebuked. So, <laughs> man. I changed it, I, I fixed this nice stew and I mashed it up and I fed him. Well, he wanted another bowl and I fed him that and he wanted another bowl. So I gave him three bowls. I said, man, I can't give you no more. You're going to blow up. Well, he did. And when he did, I'm over there talking to him and I don't know how y'all do with your babies, but I'm teasing him. I'm, whoo, you know, I'm, I'm all into it. What did you do, boy? And he's laughing and giggling and I'm cleaning him and I'm, whoo. And while I'm doing it, it's like the Lord says, now you know how I feel with you. Uh, I'm like, do you have to use that one? <laughs> Let's find another illustration, but not that one. But I'm serious. I'm sitting there cleaning his bottom, and the Lord's like, see, you can be like that. And I thought, am I happy when you're cleaning mine? <laughs> he is. So anyway, oh, Jesus, he's so good. But that's the neat thing about children. They really do reveal to you what it's like. Hello. Being a father shows you a lot what your heavenly father deals with. Your angers, your, your upsetness to things you shouldn't be, your lack of patience, all the little faults and stuff, you know. And the truth is, all of that is nothing but a weak muscle that just needs to be developed. We're just getting God's gym and start working out. We do it in the physical realm. Look how you feed your body. Listen, I started just working out about two and a half years ago, and I mean in no time, I can't tell you the difference of my body. I cannot tell you the difference. I, I am so much better off at 65 than I was 55. And I'm not joking. I can go back and say 45. I can go back and say 40. Now, further back that, I don't know, because I always felt like Hercules. <laughs> but, I mean, I just felt better. Well, what do you think happens when you feed the inner man? And begin to work him out and work that spiritual muscle and begin to speak the word and meditate and think on it. Put it first place in your life. How? By meditating and by reading. It keeps it first. Nobody can stop you from thinking what you think. And you can control what you think. And if you're thinking on something that's got you upset, then you might not like this, but listen. Stop thinking that. And you're like, well, you don't understand what I went through and how bad it was. It's like in front of my face every day. It's in front of your face every day because it's in your mind meditating every day. And that's what the Word would be if you was meditating on the Word like you are about the thing you hate so much. And the reason you are towards the thing you hate is because of what you meditate about it. You meditate on the Word, it'll be right here. Listen, God said, no man's seen my glory. The word man means humanist. But he says to the church, I've given my glory. So I'm not a man. I'm a bride of Christ. I'm a woman of God. If you don't like that, you got some serious problems because that's who we are. You're the bride of Christ. 
Are you all right? I got to let y'all go, I'm being told. So we look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I love that joy. And oh, God bless Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Looked at that cross and saw me. Reached over there and kissed that cross. And said, man, I'm doing this for Larry's souls. If ain't nobody on the planet but Larry. I'm telling you. I know them preachers I was telling y'all about think I'm nuts. But you know what? When I listen to all that religious, I see them heads bobbing up and down going down that river. I go get on my bicycle. I might be by myself, but glory be to God, I'm not going down that river. I'm in God's river, not the bobbling up and down one. I'm closing. But he says, said he was set before him. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him... Now listen, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners. And I think that I've been dealing with contradiction of just preachers. Hello? Sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint. Where? In your mind. And I wish I had a little more time today, but just to put it on record, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your body a living sacrifice. Work it out. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable. One says spiritual service. You want to be spiritual? Man, put that body under. Learn to fast. Matter of fact, I'll just give all of you permission to just fast one meal tomorrow. You decide. You pick it. But when you fast, it's not not eating. It's instead of eating... Decide what you want to pray about and believe for. And instead of putting the meal in you during the time that you would like to have satisfaction for your flesh, go into prayer and begin to pray. Pray for me. I would appreciate it very much. I'm not too prideful. Pray for me. Say, if you don't want to say, say, Lord, Larry. Lord gets his attention and when you say Larry, you say, oh yeah, baby, I got him. I mean, I'm very serious. If you can't think of anything to pray for me, just say, Lord Larry. And it's so funny. And I'm finding people are saying that to me all the time now. Every time I see Art, and he'll say, I pray over something when I get through. And he'll say, Lord Larry. Well, at least he prayed for me. Y'all are funny. I'm telling you. <laughs> but Romans... 12 and 1 and 2, he says, And don't be conformed to this world, cosmos, order and arrangement of the way things are. Don't be conformed to it. Be transformed. Metamorphous is what that word is. Meta, it's a metamorphosis is where we get the word from metamorphous. It's a threefold stage. He said, you got to get your mind renewed. you got to get it in here. And when you get it in here, it will drop down into here. The soul feeds the spirit. Are you hearing me? It feeds the spirit. When the spirit's fed, it controls the body. If you don't feed your spirit, then your, your, your senses in your soul, your five senses, will control and dominate your life. You will live your life based on what you feel like you need and what you want. But when you feed your spirit, the things of the enemy begin to fall off. The Satan's dominion is like nothing. It's gone. I mean, the things of the devil are like so under your feet and behind you. The fear of death is gone. When you begin to walk in that and see the purpose of God, there's not a kingdom coming. The kingdom is in me and I'm a-going. Hallelujah. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Who did he talk to? People filled with the kingdom. How we know that? Mark chapter 4. He made it real clear. The sower sows the word. Hello, the sower sows the word. The harvest was the souls in that chapter, if you stop. He wasn't trying to get you to think it was peanuts and cabbage. It's about souls. The kingdom of God like a man that sowed a seed. The word's the seed and you're the earth. If you plant it, it's going to grow. And see, the devil, if there's one thing that lying deceiver knows, he knows it works. That's why he's after you every time a seed hits you. You read Mark 4. It says as soon as you receive a word, immediately, right there, right then, Satan comes to steal it. Boy, you get a little revelation. It's funny how the person you love the most all of a sudden has got a great idea. Hey, 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 i got to tell you something. And you're like, no, 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 not now. And both of you have got something you want to do real bad. You want to listen you want to tell them. You know? 
But he comes immediately to get it. Doesn't look bad. He disguises it. Little grandma will get up in the church and just do something that needs to be rebuked. Needs to sit there. But if you do, the whole church will turn on you. You talk to grandma like that. You don't even know that the devil had grandma get up and do that to distract you. Are you hearing me? Well, we're going to go somewhere, and it's going to be good. And I can't wait to get back into this. Thanksgiving is coming and Christmas. I'm closing by telling you this is your time of the year. It is. And listen, the President of the United States has announced we're going to make Christmas great again. That's what he said. He said, I hereby give all of you the right to say Merry Christmas. Oh, some of you don't like him, so you ain't going to say Merry Christmas. I don't care whether you like him or not. I was going to say Merry Christmas anyway. And I do it all the time. Going to Walmart, Merry Christmas. And they say, Happy Holiday. I say, It's a holy day. They got it confused. It ain't a holiday. It's a holy day. It's the birth of Christ. I can't say happy holiday. Jesus was born. No. I say happy holy day. Stand up on your feet with me. Glory to God. See, even speaking in tongues like that, he can't stand that. I said something in the spirit that just excited the angels and God and they ain't a devil in hell knows what it was. You say, well, your mind doesn't know it either. That's all right because my mind's been renewed by the spirit of the Lord. So my thinking is in the realm of the spirit, not the flesh. Father, I release an anointing in this house to stir the hearts of a people up to trust you, to know you, walk with you, to share you, to go out and let others know that you care for them. This time of the year, Father, is a season that hearts are tender. People's minds are open. Statistically, they say the depression is greater at this time of the year on people than any other time. More suicides than any other time. More tragedies. And oh God, you're a good news God in a bad news place. And I thank you right now for the anointing on this church and on this people. That as you lay your hands on the sick, they shall recover. As you witness, the Spirit of the Lord shall do His part and touch their hearts. And as you go forth, you will go in an anointing that break and destroy every yoke of bondage the enemy would bring. Yokes are around the neck. The neck stands for will. So I'll say it this way. As you go, the will of the enemy will be broken against you. And the will and purpose of God will rise up. And the yoke will be the Father around your neck. Hallelujah. Because He said, bind your neck. Bind the Word to your neck. Bind it to your fingers. He means what you do and your will. Hallelujah. Bind yourself to that Word. Let the Word of God get in you and dwell mightily and richly. And in times of trouble and pain and sickness and disease. Hallelujah. You can stand up. And even if the fact is you're still hurting, you can say, the Word is working mightily in me right now. If it's in your back, let's lay your hand on it and say, the Word is working mightily in me right now. You've been told you have lung cancer? Lay your hand on your lungs and say, the Word is working mightily in me. Some of you respect Kenneth Copeland very, very much. And I'm going to tell you something. That's a wise man. He's got three areas in his body right now. Nobody knows what they are. But all he'll say about it is this. Glory. Now he give you a testimony about what God just did with the plaque in his body. It was phenomenal. Then as soon as he finished, he said, glory to God, the word's working mightily in me. And the plaque was all gone. He said, and I've got three other areas that the word is working mightily in me. Here's what he did not say. And would not say and will not say. I got three areas I'm real sick in. I'm real sick. And I'm working on them three things. He didn't identify that as sickness. He said, I got three areas in my life that the Word is working mightily in me. And he is saying at age 80, if you will, to look like he looks and preach like he preaches and do what he does, that's not bad for 80. 
And he's going, and glory to God, I know that them three areas are in his hand because the word works mightily in me. You be the same way. Is there something going on in your body that if you speak the word, it makes you feel like, well, maybe I didn't have enough faith. I don't know if that really works. Oh, get away from all that. That's them heads bobbling up and down the river. Listen, get on the bicycle. The bicycle says you're healed by the stripes of Jesus. You are blessed coming in, going out in the city, in the field, in the basket, and in the store. And don't worry about money. Money will take care of itself. People say, are you a prosperity preacher? I said, when I preach for people to be delivered, protected, preserved, made completely whole, there's no greater prosperity than a man getting right with God and having eternal life. Yeah, I preach prosperity. Well, what about the money? It's nothing but a bright byproduct of what God's doing. Just like paper. You can't get it without the tree. Hello, you get God, you'll get some money. He'll take care of you. Yes, He will. I said God will take care of you. If you put Him first, He will not forsake you. He said, I've never seen the righteous, those that do right, forsaken. I've never even seen their children beg for bread. Never. Never means what? Never. So, Father, I thank you. I thank you for the anointing. As we get ready to close, I'm just going to let our worship leader lead us in a song. And so that as we go out the doors, we can picture in our mind that we came in through the brazen altar and we just got through with some word. But now what we want to do is just go into that heavenly place and give Him our love, our thanks, and our praise. And remember, you can't praise Him and not get his attention. You, it's like a baby saying, Dad, Dad. I got a 10-month-old grandbaby that can say, Granddaddy. Why? Because I've got more faith that he can say, Granddaddy, than wait until he's a year and a half to say, Paw, Paw. Or as my son says, Papa. No, 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 no. I know y'all love that stuff, but I'm old school. I'm Granddaddy, and that's my grandbaby. Hallelujah. Something good's happening. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo, we're going to live with a grateful heart, Lord. We're living, giving you thanks, oh God. Hallelujah. Go ahead, sex.
give thanks unto your holy son. We give thanks because you've given Jesus Christ, your son. We give thanks with a grateful heart. We give thanks unto the Holy One. We give thanks because He's given Jesus. so much for coming to eat and drink God's word and worship with us. It's an honor. And I tell you one thing, old York County is getting ready to get a good shaking. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. And as we release your sons and daughters to go out of that door, that in this Thanksgiving season, we are very thankful. And I'm thankful for a people that will grab crosses and, and will pray and will witness and share Christ. And I thank you, Father, for every one of them today that will step up and say, I'm always ready to be used of the Lord, to do His will, and to bless His holy name. So, Father, I bless them and grace them in the name of Jesus. We release them in the authority to go do the Word, and may they take every necessary tool they need with them. And that is your Word in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Do you enjoy the worship, by the way? I do too. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Glory to God. All right, go do the word. Y'all funny. <laughs> <laughs> 